Hello, everyone, and welcome to the November 2023 Kalamazoo Astronomical Society Astrophotography Special Interest Group meeting. And of course, welcome to the second installment of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society's Eclipse Series. So uh, thank you for everyone that joined us on November 3rd for Dr. Tyler Norgren. Uh, just keep checking our YouTube channel. His, his excellent presentation will be available uh, on December 1st. So if you missed it or want to see it again, because I definitely want to see it again. Uh, again, that'll be on our YouTube channel on December 1st. Just go to YouTube, do a search for Kalamazoo Astronomy Club or Kalamazoo Astronomical Society, and you will find us. And of course, there's links to the YouTube channel through our website as well, which is just a Google away. You know, why bother giving web addresses anymore? So. Uh, we have a fantastic speaker tonight, and as you might know, this is the first part of a two-part presentation because you can't squeeze everything in and, and just one talk. you got to have at least two. We tried to get him to do six, but he said no, but we figured two two's fine, uh, so we settled with two. Uh, but we definitely have him back again and again and again if, if we could. But before we um, uh, get too far, uh, if you are joining us for the, for, for the very first time, uh, either just at, at a KAS event or as part of the Eclipse series, uh, allow me just to give you a, a preview of what we have going on. So I'm going to uh, share our, our screen here. Let me back up to the beginning because I have these set to automatically go. So again, here's Dr. Tyler Nurgren. You can see that on our YouTube channel on December 1st. Here is tonight's speaker. So we'll just kind of uh, give that a quick pass because that's obviously why you're here. And of course, uh, we'll have more information about uh, part two, how to process your Eclipse images later. If you have not registered, we'll plug the registration link in there. And then of course, uh, we have another Canadian. So we're kind of in the Canadian phase of the Eclipse series here. We're gonna have uh, Jay Anderson uh, come to Kalamazoo on January 12th. So of course, this is a strictly a Zoom meeting, uh, but for those of you that do live in Southwest Michigan, be sure to join us at the Math and Science Center. But if you can't make it to Kalamazoo, uh, please do join us on Zoom. And uh, of course, back to the astrophotography stuff. Of course, Alan will uh, talk about basically how to take your eclipse pictures, how to process your eclipse pictures. But if you don't want to mess with your camera at all when it's taking pictures through the telescope, for example, uh, these guys will help you. Fred and uh, 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 Huvier or Xavier, I'm not sure which it is. Someone can help me with that. Uh, they'll be talking about the programs they developed, Eclipse Orchestrator and Solar Eclipse Maestro, one's PC, one's Mac. Uh, so that'll be in uh, January, on January 19th. Uh, then we have Dr. Michael or Michael Zeller. Uh, he'll be in Kalamazoo on February 2nd. He does the Great American Eclipse website. And then of course, in March, we have kind of the main event, you could say, Mr. Eclipse himself, Fred S. Mac. He'll be presenting uh, via Zoom. Uh, he didn't want to come to Kalamazoo. He doesn't want to take a chance of getting COVID and missing the eclipse next month, so we can't blame him. And then kind of as a bonus, um, Alan Friedman, fantastic solar imager, will be joining us uh, at our Astrophoto SIG meeting on March 15th. So that is the uh, eclipse series in a quick nutshell. Of course, you can go to the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society's website, go to the activity menu, Look for the Eclipse Series link, and you can see more details on all the presentations on the Eclipse Series page. And, of course, you can find those registration links for those of you that uh, uh, joined us on Zoom. But, again, we really, really want to have people come in person when it's made available. Okay, so... Uh, allow me to introduce our guest speaker. We've been waiting a long time for this, and we don't want to wait anymore. So tonight's guest speaker first spoke during our 80th anniversary celebration in November 2016. Uh, let me just uh, uh, pause the intro here and, and take us back to that, because this is kind of a famous image on our website here. We, we've shared this quite a bit. 
Alan knows this picture well. He he's seen it before. So this is taken by one of our members, Kevin Jung, and this is when Alan uh, did visit us in person in November 2016 when you're when you were still able to do stuff like that. And uh, we had roughly uh, at least 120 people present there, and I'm happy that we've uh, easily shattered uh, that record at least here on Zoom tonight. I mean. You, just can't beat meeting in person because I, I remember the, the start of this meeting very well. Alan had this beautiful Milky Way shot, uh, you know, with mountains in the foreground. And uh, one of our more jealous members sitting over here, Mike Sinclair, uh, and I warned Alan about this, about the way we admire pictures. We sort of insult the people. And Mike says, as soon as he saw that first picture pop up, uh, I hate you. Uh, but Alan laughed. He, he knew exactly that it was the highest compliment that we tend to pay to our fellow astrophotographers. But um um, if you want to say you hate Alan and you see his pictures, you'll have to put them in the chat this time. But, um, you know, it's not as fun as when uh, Sinclair does it. So it, it won't quite work for for you folks. <laughs> so uh, he is one of Canada's best known astronomy authors and astrophotographers. Uh, and he happily retired from many rewarding years of producing planetarium shows for theaters in Winnipeg, Edmonton, and Calgary. And he now lives in Southern Alberta, Canada. He, of course, is a co-author with the late, great Terence Dickinson of the popular guidebook for amateur astronomers, The Backyard Astronomer's Guide. And he has also prepared a new ebook, uh, How to Photograph the Solar Eclipses. Uh, of course, one of those was last month, so now it's Solar Eclipse. And information about both books is on his website, Amazing Sky. Just Google Alan Dyer Astrophotography and you'll find it. He has traveled to every continent chasing total solar eclipses, chalking up to 16 thus far. Um, perhaps he'll update us on that in case he's bagged a few more since then. But he is a member of the international, the World at Night Photography Group, and he does have an asteroid named after him. I mean, who... Who doesn't, right? So without further ado, please welcome Mr. Alan Dyer. Thank you very much, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here um, for uh, the first of two talks. Uh, next month, we'll be on processing, so we won't get into that at all uh, tonight. But this is how to shoot the eclipses. And um, I have an eclipse image here in the background from 2005 from an uh, eclipse cruise I was on uh, for the April. It was a hybrid eclipse seen north of Pitcairn Island. Um, so tonight, however, is is all about and I'm gonna share the share my get my screen sharing here. And uh there hopefully that's you're seeing seeing the image. Perfect from the from the first slide, how to capture the total eclipse. And it is the total eclipse. I'll talk a little bit about the annular that was uh, last month. Um, and uh, this is kind of based on the ebook uh, that I have out. And uh, I see some people in the chat uh, saying that they've got it, they like it. It's how to photograph the solar eclipses because uh, it came out back in June and it covered the annular eclipse in October. But I've since revised that book and anybody who bought the PDF edition or the Apple Books edition, there's two editions uh, available at my website, amazingsky.com, uh, should get the update, which is now post-annular with some information in the chapter on processing and how to process the annular eclipse images that you may have gotten uh, and uh, and lessons learned at the annular eclipse as well. Don't do what I did. I made some bad mistakes. Um, and so that book has been revised. Now focuses on, of course, the total eclipse next year, April 8th, which is what we're here to talk about. So that's my ebook. It's available only as an ebook, not a print edition, but for Apple Books and also as a PDF for any anybody, any other platform, or uh, if you want to put it on your Android tablet or whatever. So that's available at my website. Tonight's talk, the goal here is to get some great images of the total eclipse coming up while you're still able to see it and enjoy the experience. You're not so preoccupied with taking pictures. So using simple methods requiring a minimum of attention to gear and settings so the least can go wrong. That's the thing, especially if it's your first total eclipse. 
where the advice often is, hey, if it's your first eclipse, don't even bother taking pictures. Just enjoy the visual experience. But almost everybody wants to get a souvenir picture of it. And there are simple ways of doing it. And that's the focus tonight. We'll talk about some of the more advanced methods. But the focus is how to get some great souvenir pictures or movies, but not be so preoccupied with running cameras that you miss seeing the eclipse. And that's what happens. Well, my eclipse chasing highlights include uh, so 16 is still the number. Um, Turkey in 1999, deep in Kurdistan, uh, Pitcairn Island, I show the picture there, over Antarctica on a plane over Antarctica in 2003, in Gaddafi's Libya in 2006, where we were welcomed and the skies were fabulous, and from the Chilean Altiplano in 1994, shot on film, of course, in that time, and then in an aircraft over the Canadian Arctic in 2008, the last uh prior to 2017 the last total eclipse of the sun in north america we were the first first to see it at sunrise at about three in the morning over the canadian arctic in 2008 so i've shot the eclipses from sea from land from air uh but the one in 2017 was fabulous uh, where were you? Maybe you you saw it. And if you if you did, of course, you want to see another one. But if you didn't, boy, this is your chance to make up for the fact that you just didn't get to the 2017 eclipse and you should have. You don't want to miss the one coming up in uh, next year. So where were you? This was a satellite picture of the shadow of the moon just beginning to touch the co west coast of the United States there, passing it all the way across. This was the all-American eclipse all the way across the United States. So fabulous eclipse. I was in Idaho um, looking towards the Grand Tetons, uh, north of Driggs, Idaho, uh, for a, a beautiful sky. It could not have been better. All the worries about smoke and everything kind of dissipated entirely and got some close-up shots uh, here. And next month, we'll talk about how to assemble some of these multiple exposure shots as well. But um, it was a fabulous eclipse for me. Uh, but nevertheless, we want to see another one. You always want to see it again. You never see and experience everything. This is next month's or next year's eclipse, April 8, 2024. I'm sure you're familiar with the path uh, in Mexico. United States and Canada. So this is the great North American eclipse, the first total eclipse in Canada since 2008. And in Southern Canada, where most people live in, in my country since 1979, I think it would be. Um, but next year, you got to be in that yellow path to see totality. And I suspect most viewers are kind of aware of that. But nevertheless, people sometimes say, well, I uh, it's 98% where I live. That's 98% of the experience. No, it's not. It's 2% of the experience. You have to be in the path of totality. There's no such thing as 99% totality. So anybody's advertising, come to us and it's 99%. That's almost as good. No, it's not. You have to be in that path. Don't have to be in the center line of the path. Wherever it's convenient to be or camping or whatever, that's great. And if you want the detailed maps, greatamericaneclipse.com. Michael Zeiler, who runs it, will be here next year. So check it out uh, for all the detailed maps and books you can buy. Now, last month, we had the October 14th annual eclipse of the sun, where the moon moved across the center of the sun, but wasn't big enough to cover the entire sun. So uh, this uh, annual eclipse, it's got... I don't know what you would call it in terms of percentage of the experience of a total eclipse. It's exciting. It's unique. The light got dimmer. It was very interesting, but it's definitely an eclipse connoisseur's eclipse, the annual eclipse, and properly called a ring of fire eclipse. So I hope you had a chance to see it, but this is one that if you were not in the path of annularity, you saw a deep partial eclipse. Well, you, you saw a neat eclipse, but it was neat to be in the actual path of annularity itself for some neat views through a telescope, but you really have to appreciate it through a telescope in annular eclipse. I shot with three different cameras. This is the wide angle composite shot I took uh, over Bryce Canyon in Utah, taking a unfiltered shot at sunrise and then putting the filter on as I show on the left of the camera and just letting it track and taking a shot every minute and just picking every third shot uh, filtered shot to get the eclipse sun 
set in the morning sky over Bryce Canyon. So that worked that worked very well. It was a great location. Uh, took a telephoto composite. And these are the kind of shots I'm also going to talk about in terms of the total eclipse as well. A telephoto composite where I just put a, that camera, that lens right there, and just let the sun drift across the frame, filtered exposures all the time, and just let the, the sky do the moving for me. I wasn't tracking the sun. This is another way you can shoot the total eclipse coming up. Annulars are easier because you always have the filter on the lens or the telescope. You don't have to fuss with suddenly getting the filter off at the right time and putting it back. That can be harrowing, harrowing experience. So annulars are easier, uh, certainly. And I shot telescopic uh, close-ups as well. Not with this telescope for mount, with another one similar to it but close up through a four inch telescope, showing that little bit of beating along the, the where the moon just got tangent to the sun's limb there. And just the moon, sunlight is breaking up because of the mountains and craters on the moon. That's kind of reverse Bailey's beads. We get the opposite with bright beads of light as totality begins next year. So the annual eclipse was successful for me, despite making a couple of technical errors and glitches, it was a learning experience. And uh, and in terms of getting uh, great practice, testing equipment, testing on the pressure of time, some that eclipse is going to happen regardless of whether you're ready or not. Testing for vibration and sharpness. In your excitement, you can just sh shake the cameras and telescopes and everything ends up blurry. Perfecting your focusing. Everybody worries about what's the best exposure. It's the focus that ruins most eclipse pictures. So getting that focus down precisely and practicing how to focus. So the annular eclipse, and I'll talk about at the end, other practice methods as well, was a great practice run for the total eclipse. So if you're able to get great shots of the annular or the partial phases, whatever, you've got a long, you know, you've gone a long way to practicing for the total eclipse. But the photographing of the total eclipse, a total eclipse, can be a challenge. It can be one of the easiest astrophotos to take, but it can also be one of the most difficult if you elect to get, uh, you know, go through one of the more challenging methods. And as a result, if you're choosing more complicated methods, the, the effort of fussing with the cameras and all that can prevent you from seeing the eclipse. And that's the great tragedy, not coming away from the eclipse and having pictures that are spoiled or fuzzy or badly exposed, whatever. Yeah, you don't want that to happen. But you don't want to come away with, say, bad pictures and not having seen the eclipse as well. Um, because you can be staring at the camera screen all the time. And then you just miss the great spectacle that's going on all around you in the sky. Or the opposite happens. You're so overwhelmed by that spectacle, you just forget what to do with the cameras. And as as well. So that's where keeping things simple really helps, especially if it is your first eclipse. So my methods tonight in increasing an in order of increasing complexity and demand on your time is your phone camera, wide angle time lapse, telephoto videos, telephoto stills, and then a telescope on a tracking mount. Those are kind of in, in the increasing order of complexity and demand on your time. And so choose the latter more wisely. Maybe you not, don't want to do that if it is your first eclipse. But what? first of all, solar filters. You've got to have proper solar filters for the partial phases. You needed it for the entire annular eclipse last month. But for the next eclipse, eclipse in April, you need a solar filter on your lens or telescope or whatever for the partial phases. But it's got to come off during totality, just before totality. So you need it only for the partial phases. And I kind of prefer glass or mylar filters. Um, this was the this was the filter. I uh, used over my four inch telescope for the annular eclipse. It's a, you know, mylar filter with a little, little sun finder aid here on the top uh, from Kendrick. And I use some glass filters for the, for the wide angle shots as well. There's a black polymer type of filter, but I find in testing those, and I have two or three of those from brands, and I found those were too soft. Great for visual, 
but too soft for photographic use and kind of scatter the light too much. So glass or mylar filters and the glass filters are getting harder to find. Uh, I, I had for many years, this glass filter from Thousand Oaks Optical, it was my go-to filter for, gosh, many solar eclipses for the last three decades or so. Went to order a new one. Nope, the Thousand Oaks doesn't have the glass filters anymore. So glass filters from a lot of suppliers are getting harder to find. Um, but, um, and, and where can you get them? I think I've got the next slide. Oh, I want to mention this. Photographers, I mean, not so much an audience of astronomers, but photographers often think, well, I've got neutral density filters that you, you use for normal landscape photography. Can't I use those or can I just stack those? No. Uh, in photography world, an ND8 or ND16 filter, that's whatever, two or three stops reduction is kind of your standard. For solar eclipses, you need an ND100,000. You need it to reduce the sunlight by 16 stops. Get the filter made specifically for eclipse and sun photography. Don't try to cobble together something from your stack of photographic filters and to try to do the job. Don't do it. It may not work, period, or it still can be dangerous to your eyes or to your camera's uh, sensor as well. If it's sliding through too much light, or letting through infrared light that um, that is of no consequence for normal photography, but it can be dangerous for solar photography. So get the right filters. If you don't have them now, get them as soon as possible because uh, 2017 is anything to go by. They'll become really scarce and hard to find or will be scalped at high prices come next March or so. Um, uh, case filters uh, in, in, uh, in the U.S., uh, sell some screw in. In fact, actually, magnetic filters. Uh, let's see, I've got got it here. A little magnetic filter that you you kind of clamp uh, clicks onto your, the front of your lens. That's what I use for the solar composite shot uh, in the annular eclipse. And that's an ND one hundred thousand filter from Case, and uh, his little magnetic lens cap on it. So. Uh, you got to search for that on their site, Case Filters. Kendrick um, Astro Instruments here in Canada sells a Botter solar film, but has a nice implementation of it with the uh, open cell that I just showed you with the little sun finder. I really like those. And Seymour Solar does sell some glass filters. I use uh, one of theirs for the telephoto lens shot. And uh, they have, I'm not sure if they have mylars, but they do have some glass filters threaded that will go into camera lenses as well. So those are three suppliers that I've bought filters from and used at the end of your clips, filters from all three suppliers. Get your filter soon and start practicing with it if you haven't already got it or haven't used it uh, to figure out what the exposure should be. Because during the partial phases, except when it gets, maybe when it gets down to a very thin crescent, the exposure for an uneclipsed sun will be the same as during most of the partial phase of the total eclipse. And so you want to get your exposure down. Uh, you know, the sun is bright, but you don't want to make the disc too bright because you can wash out detail on the sun's disc and sunspots, but you don't want to get it too dark as well. So figure out what your correct exposure should be uh, in practice runs uh, well before the eclipse. And typically it's very short with a solar filter, 2 50th of a second. ISO 100, don't use a high ISO, slow ISO. And f5.6 or whatever, even the lens wide open would be fine, but but f5.6, something like that. So figure that out because it can vary quite a bit from filter to filter to filter what the correct exposure will be, uh, depending on the density of the filter. The easiest method, however, to capture the eclipse during totality um, just the the view of the eclipse sky is just your phone camera. Just hold your camera up and just grab a picture and or have someone in your family do that. Just aim and shoot with no filter on it, just during totality. Just take a few seconds to do that. Your camera should autofocus okay, and the auto exposure will probably work fine. Or you can zoom in with the telephoto lens to get a close-up view. Or better, I would say, put it on some kind of tripod like I show here. 
so you can perhaps set the camera to do a time lapse, a game with no filter, starting a few minutes before totality and ending a few minutes after. Or better yet, take a 4K movie. Almost all the phones now take 4K movies and certainly with sound and just get it going, aiming and framing and just get that movie going two or three minutes before totality, five minutes before totality and just let it run. Just aim it so maybe your group, family group, is in is framed in front of the camera and looking up at the eclipse, however you might wish to frame it for a souvenir movie. Because the nice thing about using something like this is that it captures the sound. And the sound is uh, of your excitement and the group all around you and everybody cheering is as much a part of the experience as the visual sight. So it's really nice to capture a movie like this. And just auto exposure will do a great job. Uh, just don't forget to stop your camera after totality. Don't leave it aimed at the sun uh, uh, all, the, all the time as you're partying. Just stop it. And you'll get a nice souvenir. And that would be the minimum. You could you could do a minimum effort, assign that to a family member to do as well or whatever, and you'll get some nice results. And that'll be a good souvenir image or movie of the total eclipse experience. And most cameras now these days, their wide angle lens is really wide and will capture the foreground and the sun, even from further south than Texas or Mexico, where the sun will be quite high. We'll still capture the entire scene and capture the the motion of the earth or the moon's shadow. But to get that, that kind of motion of the moon's shadow, I suggest the next step up in complexity is, is uh, and I, I almost always take this kind of image at every total eclipse where I'm on the ground or, or from at sea, is this time-lapse wide angle. Just setting up wide angle lens, wide enough to capture the whole scene and, uh, and just letting it run in a time-lapse mode with an intervalometer. Uh, this is the, the kind of framing you need. Uh, in Texas, a 24 millimeter lens uh, uh, vertically or a 20 millimeter lens horizontally, assuming a full frame DSLR or mirrorless camera will frame. It takes a fairly wide angle because the sun's up pretty high from Texas to frame the landscape below, which you kind of want, as well as the twilight on the horizon and the eclipse sun above it. So that's the kind of framing you need from further south along the path or further north and east along the path, say southern Ontario. It, the sun is lower, it's later in the afternoon sky, so you don't need as wide an angle lens to frame the scene, either vertical with a 35 or a horizontal with a 24, assuming again a full frame camera here. We'll frame the scene very nicely and you can just frame it a few minutes or before the eclipse, the to total eclipse starts and just get the camera going, taking a series of time-lapse frames. Now to plan the framing yourself for where you think you're going to be, use Stellarium or Sky Safari or Starry Night or whatever. You can set up a field of view indicator for your particular lens and camera to see how much of the scene uh, it will frame and where the sun or moon will be so that you can frame it properly and preview how you need to frame it uh, and uh, and then use camera going uh, once you've got it framed up properly. So you can plan your framing with some planetarium software beforehand for your particular site where you know you're going to be for the eclipse. And so how you do that is you frame your scene as per your planetarium software, manually focus the lens, don't use autofocus, no filter in this particular case, but cover the lens until it's needed uh, about five minutes before totality. And then set the camera to auto exposure with a wide area sampling, not a spot meter, just the auto exposure meter is sampling a, a wide area of the sky. And I usually like to underexpose by about one stop. So there's exposure compensation to minus one EV, just so that all the images are just a little underexposed. And then the intervalometer either built into the camera or as I show here on the right, uh, a outboard intervalometer set to one second intervals. So it's just gonna keep firing the camera, bang, 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 every second. The exposures, even during mid totality, likely will not be longer than about a second. ISO 100, 
wide open lens, 2.8, something like that. And, and the exposures likely will not get longer than a second. So you're just getting a whole rapid fire sequence, which you can turn into a time lapse movie later or pick, as I did here, individual frames out at the beginning or middle or end of totality to capture the sky, the foreground, the horizon twilight. And you can just set and forget this. Just don't forget it until, you know, a few minutes after totality is over. Make sure you grab the camera, tap the lens, move pointed away from the sun. But it's fine to be having it aimed at the sun for the few minutes either side of totality. Uh, you just don't want it aimed at the sun for the entire eclipse without a filter or lens cap on the lens itself. And hopefully this will show through the zoom. This is the, this is an example of that one of those movies shot with a fisheye lens in this case, where the shadow of the moon whooshes in, the sky changes and then gone, and then it, off it goes again. In this case, an aircraft, uh, Air Force jet was vainly chasing the moon shadow uh, from, from Idaho here. So that's the kind of time-lapse video uh, that you can uh, create uh, quite simply, just repeating it again. And and then and you pick up the bright planets. There was, I think, Venus in the sky and as well. And uh, it's a very neat way to capture it. Once again, you just kind of get things set properly, get it going a few minutes before totality and forget it until a few minutes after. And you can enjoy the rest of the uh, rest of the eclipse. And it will capture, we have at, at next year's eclipse with Venus on one side and Jupiter on the other side of the sun. They should show up naked eye, but also any, any kind of time lapse uh, like that. They should show up as well. Probably not anything else. There's a, maybe a comet that might be, but if it's very bright, but I, I doubt it. But Venus and Jupiter will certainly show up uh, in, in shots like that. So that's an easy way to get uh, an eclipse sequence. Now, a step up in complexity is a telephoto lens. People always want to shoot eclipses with as much focal length as possible. Here I'm shooting with a, a, about a 300 millimeter telephoto in the 2017 eclipse. Similar setup to what I show here. Just not tracking, just aimed. Once again, planned so I know where to put the sun at the start of totality or a minute or so before totality. Totality it hasn't yet officially started in the movie here. It's still a real diamond ring. I've taken the filter off. You saw that when I suddenly the scene went really bright. I took the filter off. And again, it's safe for a couple of minutes, a minute or so, either side of totality. And then I'm just letting a movie camera run into movie mode and just running a 4K movie and, uh, and just letting the sun drift across the frame. Uh, so not tracking at all, nothing to fuss in a line or whatever, but just aim so that you know you put the sun at the right spot and you know it'll move across the frame and won't move out of the frame by the, by the time mid-totality, the end of totality. So here now you get a movie of the diamond ring. And here's totality officially beginning. There is the start of totality. And this is all on auto exposure with the camera on movie mode. And auto exposure will work quite well. You have to manually focus, but auto exposure will work very well. It'll even compensate for removing the, removing the filter and, and it will get bright for a second or so and then compensate. And so you get uh, an image or a movie, once again, recording the sound as well, uh, very nicely without any effort other than just making sure you get it going just before totality and don't forget to end it after totality. So something like a 300 to 500 millimeter lens on a fixed tripod, just let the sun drift through the frame, lens aperture wide open to avoid diffraction spikes from the diamond rings as caused by the lens iris. And low ISO, once again, ISO 100 or something like that. Aperture priority, auto exposure, start the movie recording with the solar filter on, that's okay. And then remove it just about a minute before totality. And then just remember to replace the filter or cap the lens or whatever after totality, after the diamond ring is over. So that's another easy way that also, once again, gets a movie and records sound as well. That worked really well uh, in 2017.
So in terms of video settings, aperture priority, auto exposure can work well. There are ways of varying the exposure, but that's that takes effort during totality. Um, mirrorless cameras nowadays also have the option of a called a well in Canada C log. It's a it's a more advanced method of kind of a it's kind of like shooting raw pictures in movies, not quite, but it gives you more dynamic range. You have to do more work in processing, shoot in C log or Nikon is called N log or Sony, it's S log, but in log mode, uh, which gives you a little more dynamic range to play with in processing later. But the auto exposure, as I show here in the film strip across the middle, shows you with the filter on and then removing it, it gets really bright for a second, but then the auto exposure kicks in and drops you back to a correct exposure for the diamond ring here. This was in Australia in 2012. Shooting the best quality is 4K or some cameras have 8K video now. Um, movie crop mode where you can crop into a smaller area. The sensor can work well, give you a little more reach, a little more telephoto lens reach uh, perhaps as well. And or there's uh, some cameras have a high quality 4K mode where you're resampling from a larger area of the sensor down to give you a little more resolution. These are all things you can experiment with with the sun now or with the moon, as I'll say on the last slide as well, for practicing and how to get the best video settings. Because if you do kind of set up the video wrong, it's hard to fix that later in post production. But anyway, that's another option that you might not have thought of, but it's fairly easy to do and gets you a nice video as far to, to include in your family souvenir album or video that you put on YouTube or whatever, and also gets you the audio. And that is wonderful. It's the audio you actually do remember and, and draw, brings back the memories more than anything. But once again, like the time lapse, you've got to frame it properly so that you put the sun at the right spot on the frame uh, at the right time, uh, not get it there too soon. And, and then it goes too far and drifts off. And so this shows eight minutes of motion with a 600 millimeter telephoto lens as to how much and the totality be about four minutes of the center of that motion. So that's kind of what you could do with a video camera as well. So that's an option is uh, uh, the video telephoto lens. Now, close-up stills through a telephoto lens or a small telescope on an altazimuth mount, not tracking here, that's how most people are going to want to shoot the eclipse. You know, get their the biggest telephoto lens they can muster. And, and okay, it, yeah, it can work. But it, it now you're starting to talk about a little more effort and uh, more things can go wrong. And we're just talking here on a static tripod not tracking that'll be the next section and for a telescope a short focus refractor works really well uh on the left that's the setup i used for the annular eclipse for the telephoto composite last month the 100 to 400 millimeter telephoto zoom that i have from canon set at 400 worked great on the right is the setup I used in Libya in 2006, a little 66 millimeter Apple refractor uh, on a little Altazimuth stellar view, Altazimuth mount, very nice and lightweight, easy to airline transport. And so I was always having to nudge and recenter, but it still worked great for a nice portable setup for close ups without a lot of focal length. Three, four, 500 millimeters as much as you really want. You do want to get some focal length, though, because the sun and the moon are surprisingly small. This shows you the size of the sun here. It's the little ring of the annular eclipse um, uh, in various focal lengths with a full frame camera. So 135 and 200, not really quite enough. You want to get up to about a three or 400. 800, yes, it's not bad, but more things can go wrong. More things can get shaky or whatever, and it's harder to keep the sun centered if you do need to recenter it so i think like 300 to 600 millimeter lenses or equivalent focal length telescopes are kind of best for a total eclipse because remember it isn't just the sun and the moon you're after it's the sun's atmosphere which extends out two or three or four solar diameters and much farther that's the real subject of your images so you don't want to crop in that's why i do not do not suggest People using great big telescopes. Hey, you want to get that, that big Celestron C8 or whatever? Yeah, there are some interesting shots you can get with it, but you don't need to take your biggest telescope with you. 
because it's going to have too small a field of view unless you want to go right after tiny prominence or something. It's the corona that is the beautiful aspect of any total eclipse. So I would avoid any telescopes with, say, over a thousand millimeter, millimeter focal length. A little short focus refractor, 80 millimeter or even a four inch refract, perfect. It's all you need, even a little 66 millimeter like I use there in Libya. Perfect for a total eclipse. The secret, however, no matter what optics you got, is focusing. Because that's where pictures go wrong. And you get the exposures right, and the exposures are pretty forgiving. You can be a little over or underexposed, either for the partial phases or certainly for the total totality and still get great pictures but if you're out of focus that's hard to fix later the focus will not change when you remove the filter people think it's going to change because they're used to if you're a deep sky photographer you put filters in the path and you have to now refocus you change filters you got to refocus that's what the filter in the path between the optics and the camera sensor that does shift the focus here, we're talking about a filter in the front of a telescope, you know, mounted over the front of a telescope. And if you remove that filter, the focus does not change. So don't worry about that. Focus during the partial phases on the limb or the crescent sun or whatever, or sunspot, and get it as sharp as possible. What might shift the focus, however, is the temperature changes during the onset of the, of the eclipse. A, it gets warmer during the morning. Oh, and then it gets cooler as the eclipse progresses. So the focus can shift or the, the temperature change can shift the focus. So you want to refocus and check up, touch up the focus in the last thin partial phases to make sure you got it. But then during totality, you don't need to worry about it. People spend time refocusing during totality. No, don't waste your time on that. So anyway, Getting images sharp makes all the difference for getting great shots, no matter what lens you're shooting with and what focal length. Exposures, people fuss about what's the best exposure. There is no best single best exposure for a total eclipse of the sun. No one exposure can actually record all that your eye can see. This is where the camera is not as good as the eye in many respects. A thousandth of a second is what you need for the diamond rings. And then as you get longer and longer, you're seeing more and more of the corona as it extends out. That corona is very bright, close to the sun, but then fades out quite a bit. And so you need longer and longer exposure to record the more outer beautiful streamers, a tenth of a second here on the bottom right. As long as one second really blows out the inner corona, it's overexposed. But now you're getting the outer corona any stars, perhaps, and we had Regulus near the sun in 2017, but also you're picking up the Earth shine on the dark side of the moon. You're seeing the features on the moon. So if you want to record those, you need an exposure of maybe one or two seconds, perhaps. Uh, and again, once again, shoot ISO 100, uh, f4.5 or your telescope whatever your telescope uh, focal ratio is or your telephoto lens fairly wide open and uh and that would get you great shots the only exception to be at is if you want to shoot with the untracked camera maybe a higher iso might be necessary to keep the exposure times down if you want to go for those really long exposures because Still image settings, uh, well, first of all, I'll, I'll just mention some of the other camera settings for still images. Then I have a slide about what's the maximum exposure you can go. Shoot raw, absolutely. For a DSLR, don't use mirror lockup. Just put your camera in live view and then you can watch the eclipse on the rear screen. For DSLMs or mirrorless cameras, you can use electronic first curtain shutter that that opens the shutter electronically, but closes it mechanically, a little less vibration that way. And then because no one exposure can record the whole eclipse phenomena, it's nice to shoot a range of exposures from short to quite long. And auto exposure bracket, can help you do that. So you can set up the camera so it automatically when you fire the shutter, automatically takes a series of five or seven or nine, it varies with the camera. Exposures, two thirds or one stop apart. So it goes bang, 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 bang. And you get a whole series of exposures 
automatically taken with only kind of one press of the shutter button. Usually you might need to use the self timer on the camera to have that fire automatically with one press of the shutter button. And you can program that auto exposure bracketing into one of the custom user modes or in Canon here, I'm showing it's a C1 or C2 modes, U1 or U2, whatever the camera brand might call it. But it's a custom mode you can set and quickly turn the camera to that mode and have all that bracketing preset for you. You've set it up and the camera remembers those settings. So it's one less thing. You don't want to be fussing with all these detailed camera settings as totality begins. So that's one way of getting that range of exposures so you might need to record everything from diamond ring to outer corona more simply. You're still doing a little more work, but it's the camera is doing most of the work for you in terms of taking the, the range of exposures without you having to change the shutter speed dial. I would still be doing some of that, I think, because even nine stops isn't quite enough to go all the way from very short for the diamond ring to very long for the outer corona. And uh, and so sometimes you might still need to move that center point for the auto exposure bracketing by a few stops to get the whole range from diamond ring to outer corona. But that's uh, that's um, how you can do during totality. But for the diamond rings themselves, you don't want to shoot a bracketed set of exposures because most of them will be way over or way under. Something like a very short thousandth of a second exposure is probably going to work for all the whole diamond ring sequence. And here it's helpful to be in another mode called high speed continuous, where you're just firing a bunch of still shots very quickly. And you can set that up to a custom mode for the diamond rings at either end of totality. So you're just taking a whole series of shots very quickly, five frames a second, 10 frames a second. Cameras can do 20 or 30 now. Uh, and but but all the maybe the same exposure for a few seconds at the diamond rings, and then you switch the camera to the other custom mode for the bracketed set of exposures during totality itself. So it's getting a little more complex, uh, here and say that can be hard. And uh, unlike the previous method, this does require attention to the camera and changing settings during the totality. You're maybe not having to really fuss in the detail settings, but you still have to change setting from one set of settings to another and whatever and fuss with the camera. And you spend time, as I know, in 2017, looking down at the camera all the time and looking at the eclipse on the camera view screen when you should be looking up. And so this can be hard and it can take your attention away from looking at the eclipse itself. But nevertheless, if you want to take a whole series of exposures through a telephoto or a telescope, that's one way to do it and to automate it with the auto exposure bracketing. An easier alternative, and I think I'm going to try to do this uh, in, in next year, because we have Venus and Jupiter either side of the sun, it's just like a 35 millimeter lens. So just a modest wide angle lens, just aimed up and probably just on auto exposure as well. So kind of a time lapse, but just focusing, framing the sun and the planets either side uh, to capture that more sort of modest wide angle view uh, of it. And, and the exposure is long enough, you get maybe the really outer streamers of corona as well if the sky is very clear and transparent that day so that might make a nice picture that's a little easier to do as well something that's kind of unique is sort of a 35 millimeter wide angle shot to get the venus and jupiter and the and the outer corona and <laughs> the maybe the comet <laughs> that i show there if it's in the if it's bright enough to show up as well so and that kind of setup would be good as contingency plan if you have to move and set up quickly, and that can happen, where you're literally driving to a clear hole in the clouds during the partial phases with maybe only a few minutes to set up and throw something out and get something set up to get a picture of the total eclipse literally at the last minute. That can happen. It's good to have that in mind as to what would you use as a contingency setup if the worst comes to worst and you have to do that but you can still salvage a, a great view of the eclipse if you make that effort to really chase maybe a clear hole that you can just see over there if you can only get to it. And, uh, and so that's 
that's the suggestion. Have that contingency equipment uh, in mind. A good app to use, and I used it in 2017, is by um, uh, Gordon Telephone called Solar Eclipse Timer. You put it on your mobile phone, whatever, have it have it by your camera, and, and it, it gives you alerts. It knows where it is and when the eclipse is happening, and it uh, gives you alerts as to how soon before totality begins. Watch for shadow bands, remove filter now, put filter back on, middle of the eclipse, you know, warnings of when the eclipse is going to end it's a great app to use just to because every eclipse no matter how long it is seems to last 10 seconds even if four minute eclipse next month next year it will seem like it lasts 10 or 20 seconds it's over it starts before you're ready and it's over before you're ready so having an app like this is really very helpful to uh, make sure you're ready and uh, you're doing the right things at the right time the final section here is just on on um, putting a camera on a tracker. We're astronomers. We have these kind of trackers and mounts and things like that. Uh, and we can portable. They're portable. You can take them if you're flying even to the eclipse. Um, it's a it's an option for you with a telephoto lens or a small telescope. They can be shaky, especially if you're operating the camera. They can bounce around and shake and. Once again, that vibration can blur the image. And even though you focus it properly, the images suffer from just being too shaky because these things are not meant to be sort of used with you actually operating the camera, bang, 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 firing off shutters. They can be hard to aim precisely as well, you know, the ball heads and things that you typically use. So you've got to practice with these on the sun and the moon beforehand to see if you're confident enough that uh, that it that it can work for you and they need at least a rough polar alignment for them to work at all and to be useful and to do what they do is allow you to track the sun and so during the daytime as eric was asking how do you do that on eclipse morning you can just set your latitude on the mount itself to the right angle where you're at not your home latitude you're in texas or mexico or whatever to that latitude where you are and aim it as due north geographic north as possible your phone app will have you know your phone app will, will tell you which way due north is and just aim it as due north as you can eyeball it uh with your app or whatever and then at the right angle that should get you close polar alignment because you don't need to be precise you're not tracking deep sky stuff for an hour or two hours or whatever you just really need to keep the sun kind of centered for a few minutes so just but so it doesn't drift off uh and and stay centered and so that's all you really need to do uh perhaps now you can step up from that from a tracker into a more proper equatorial mount with go to or whatever, you don't need go to functions in this particular case. Just be careful not to overburden the mount with too large a lens. Take a small portable mount and then want to put a great big monster lens on it. It's just too bouncy and shaky. And then practice with it set to the latitude you're actually planning to be at and, and aimed in the direction where the sun will be because you may found, find that certain components of the mounts collide or the camera collides or something collides and you don't want to find that out on eclipse morning that suddenly you can't aim where you need to aim it at. It worked great at home. Yeah, because you were 20 degrees north latitude at home and now you're down to 30 or whatever it is. And so practice with it set up kind of where you know the sun's going to be during totality, during the eclipse and check that your mount if you're using an equatorial go-to mount, we'll track through the meridian. Is many spots the sun is going to be due south during, if not totality, maybe after totality or whatever, or during some aspect of the eclipse, the sun will pass the meridian from the eastern half of the sky to the western half of the sky. And some mounts, and I have two of them in the picture, the Skywatcher GTI, um, Star Adventure and the AM5 and I assume the AM3 smaller from ZWO, they stop dead at the Meridian or the GTI I think goes about 15 degrees past the Meridian and then there is a mechanical or a software stop that it just, the mount just stops dead and you don't want to find that out <laughs> two minutes before totality that your mount has stopped tracking so practice with that where is your sun going to be and what the path is going to follow where is it going to be in the sky and will your equipment track during that whole 
um, sequence of the eclipse. If you say you want to get a whole sequence of time lapses through all the partial phases, including a plus totality as well. So the advantages to using some sort of tracking mount, whether it's a little tr star tracker or a proper equatorial mount, is now it does allow exposures longer without image blur. Uh, without a tracking mount, your maximum exposure is a quarter to half a second, perhaps with any kind of focal length. But with a tracking mount, it keeps the sun center for good composition and makes it easier to stack and align images later in blending. You don't have to move them around as much and you're framing it properly. You don't end up with some shots way over to one side. And really, if you're going to shoot with a fair amount of focal length, I would suggest, you know, a tracking mount of some kind uh, if you want to shoot with 600 millimeters or over. But. I generally don't shoot on a total eclipse with anything more than about 600 millimeter. But a tracking mount is certainly very nice, but not essential. You don't need it. And if you want to save weight and flying to Mexico or whatever, carting it, you, you can certainly do great shots with a smaller, just an altazimuth mount, but maybe keep your focal length a little more modest in that case. There's great shots you can add with a three or 400 millimeter. So anyway, that's the advantages. But the nice thing about these eclipses is that many of us can drive to the path uh, of totality. So we can take all the gear we 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 want to. And like this, <laughs> this would be kind of my setup. It's sort of similar to what I used last month for the annular and what I used for the total of driving to Texas. It is a shot, a, a, a telescope, four-inch telescope, my astrophysics traveler. It's my loyal, trusted telescope for many eclipses now. It was designed by Roland Kristen in 1991 for the Baja Mexico eclipse. And then he put it on the market as a, as a commercial telescope for sale. And I've used it in many eclipses. So that's what I'll use to shoot the eclipse through, but then have a smaller Tele or smaller telescope piggybacked on it just for visual just so to just so you can look at the eclipse while the camera is close by and you're monitoring the camera just don't spend all your time looking at the camera and forget to look at the uh, through the eyepiece of the visual telescope that's what happened in 2017 i didn't actually look at the eclipse until 20 seconds before the end of totality so this is an ideal scope but practice with this stuff during the day. Set it all up, make sure it'll work, that it'll track, that it's not shaky, that it mechanically will work. And if you can take a whole stack of exposures from long to short, then you can literally stack them together. And we'll talk about this next month in Photoshop here I'm showing where you blend all the exposures to get the best of all worlds, as it were, the detail and the bright inner corona and the prominences and also the faint outer corona as well, or even the blue sky and a star or whatever, not a planet that won't be close enough to the sun in this particular focal length. But anyway, that's what we'll talk about next month. And that's why you take a tracking mount and go through the effort of taking lots of exposures is to stack them and blend them together as well. Or you can do composites like this where you can go crazy with blending shots of the 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 diamond rings on either side and the partial phases perhaps where you can layer and composite them. And we'll talk about this next month as well. But you've got to have the great shots to begin with to allow you to put the composites like this together. And my ebook has a whole big chapter on processing start steps from start to finish for all these types of eclipses, uh, eclipse shots from the wide angle composites and why just wide angle time lapses to the close-ups and, and blended exposures like this as well. So that gets more complicated, no question. And if you wanna get more ambitious or even if your plans are a little less ambitious, it's good to practice. The crescent moon is a good test object. The earth shine on the crescent moon, whether it's the waxing or the waning crescent moon in the morning, is a stand-in for the outer corona. You can check that your all your gear is solid and easy to aim. Practice setting it up. Make sure everything connects securely. We tend to cobble together systems for an eclipse that we don't use day to day. And practice to make sure that you can focus accurately. Vibration as you're handling the camera, especially under pressure, and you're trying to operate the camera. How long exposure can you go? Make sure that nothing is going to blur. And then practice taking the range of exposures from very short for the bright crescent to very long for the earth shine as well. And taking those range of exposures however you're going to do it. 
Yeah. In next year, uh, Fred and Xavier will tell us about their automated software for doing all this as well. So you want, if you really want to get, get ambitious, make sure you tune in for that webcast next year with Xavier and Fred with their software programs as well. So, but I'm doing things still sort of manually automating things to a certain extent, but still learn to operate your camera by feel. So you know how many clicks it, it takes to change a few shutter speeds and then do it all in a hurry in four minutes and then practice again and practice again because the eclipse will happen regardless of whether you're ready and it will end before you're ready as well. So practice on the crescent moon and of course on the filtered sun. Uh, I'm not gonna show the movie here to, uh, to tonight, but if you wanna see the result of five cameras using all these different techniques that I talked about at the 2017 eclipse, Search for totality over the Tetons on my YouTube channel, Amazing Sky, and watch a little, what is it, four-minute movie uh, music video where I take images and, and movies and time lapses and, and stills uh, from all these different methods. And I was crazy and ambitious, and I shot with five cameras in 2017. Whether I'll do that next year, I don't know. If it's your first eclipse, don't get that crazy uh, um, uh, like I show here <laughs> in my trophy shot at the end um, from 2017. Stick with something simpler that you know will work, maybe that you can just get going and running and enjoy the eclipse and then get ambitious because you'll get hooked on eclipses and you'll want to go to Iceland in 2026 or Egypt in 2027 or Australia, whatever it is in 2028, 2029, I forget. Anyway, uh, but next year we have a chance for one close to home. So good luck and clear skies on Eclipse Day. And you can find me at amazingsky.com. And that's where my ebook is. Links are available on the page uh, there at my site for downloading and buying my ebook on the Eclipse as well. So thank you very much uh, this evening. That ends the talk. Now we'll see about questions now. All right, great. That was fantastic, Alan. Boy, just uh, I know what everyone's thinking. Man, that was a ton of information. But uh, if you tuned in a bit late, just remember uh, this will be on YouTube in about a month's time. So you can watch it over and over again. But of course, uh, all the information is written down where you can follow it closely in his great uh, ebook on imaging the eclipse so again I, I highly recommend that it's not terribly expensive at all it's well worth the price even if you don't have an ipad there is a pdf version too which i bought in 2017 before i got the ipad so uh since i did all the work i'm going to take the first uh question and uh, alan i'm going to share my screen here uh this is uh from last month's annular eclipse this is with a 130 millimeter refractor mm -hmm. It's a 1 500th exposure at F7 with ISO 100. And um, my quick question is, is my exposure correct or could, could it have been a little longer? Uh, you're asking me, Richard? Yeah, I yes. think that's a little on the dark side, I think. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's certainly, you've got a lot of latitude with the exposure. But as you do bring up the exposure what can happen is you get noise showing up in the in the dark sky and uh in i found the eclipse pictures surprisingly susceptible to noise uh and you're thinking they're shooting the brightest thing in the sky not a deep sky object but uh it's better to get a little longer but not so long that yeah the sun looks really bright but now you're washing out sunspots and whatever might detail might be on the sun faculae and sunspots through a white light filter that makes and 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 will likely you know see the moon uh, cover up you know the sunspots uh, during during totality and uncover them or not during totality partial phases and then cover them and that's a ni nice thing to shoot as well and not get overexposed that you lose that detail yep. so, I, always, uh, I, I always tended to err on the side of caution I always wanted to underexpose because I didn't want to blow it up <laughs> but I'll, I, yeah, I think I'll yeah. crank it up a little bit yeah and and but during the partial phases what you can do is and what I did for the annular was had another custom mode where I just had the camera set to take three bracketed shots. You yeah. know, what I thought was correct would be correct. And one under, one over, 
or or no what was it i think i had it set so that the 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 overexposed would be the correct one and then we shoot two slightly darker or right. two slightly bright now i'm getting fixed two slightly brighter to compensate so yeah one that would be correct and then two slightly brighter to maybe account for the fact that some clouds drift through and some gets a little dimmer and things like that. So that's something you can do. And then just pick the right best ones later on. I mean, this isn't the film days. We can take thousands of pictures and sort them out later on. So you can use bracketing as well. It's just, it's a lot more work later in the, yeah. the computer sorting through them all. And then during the partial phase of just, you know, have the intervalometer go to take a shot every if you're if you're ambitious every yeah. minute or something like that to make a time lapse out of those. Yeah, I was running the Equip Eclipse Orchestrator with 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 that, so I have to find a way to see, see if I can bracket with the Eclipse Orchestrator, or customize the script. So, Fred, Fred you'll will have help. to ask have to ask yeah. Fred about that. I've not yeah. used it. Uh, <laughs> yep. Great. Yep, so, so, so that's what we're having Fred come for. Okay, so everyone now has the uh, ability to unmute themselves. Uh, you can, if you really want, put questions in the chat, but uh, we paid for extra Zoom capacity here so people could ask Alan questions up front and, and, and talk back and forth and get some good answers here. So uh, people can just try to speak up, or if you want, you can use the reaction button and uh, raise your hand and I can call on you either way. So if anybody wants to ask a question, go ahead. There's questions in the chat. Uh, All right, I, dude. There, but, well, I uh, see we'll Bill, see. Bill Smith is raising his hand. So Bill, go ahead and unmute yourself and go ahead and ask away. Hi, I just wanted to pass along. I took a time-lapse uh, photograph or film of my thermometer um, at two, 2017 in Wyoming. And you can see the temperature go down and then go back up. And I'll put that link in the chat. Just wanted to pass that along. Okay. That's another neat way to capture the eclipse uh, in a sense. And that's a great thing for maybe, uh, you know, again, a sound, it's on to a family member or a child or whatever to capture that and and uh monitor the temperature changes but it is those temperature changes that can shift the focus as well that i was talking about and it's yeah. and it's even quite neat the temperature continues to go down after totality and then finally raises up it's a total of uh i wrote an article about this it's 24 degrees total fahrenheit wow wow i'm putting the link in uh it's it's on my Flickr page. I'm putting the Great. Okay, we can go ahead and do a question from the chat. There's one here from Larry. He says, uh, during totality, after the white light filter has been removed, does it help or hinder if you have an IR filter on your camera? Now, an IR filter in the sense of a filter that blocks infrared light, yeah. because almost all cameras have such a filter built into them that are normal cameras you can buy dslrs or mirrorless cameras that have that filter removed so they are infrared sensitive for you know the infrared landscape photography we got the white trees things like that people like to use that i've never used and i don't know of people who have used such a camera for a total eclipse um i think the focus could be an issue there if you're capturing infrared as well that it's not going to focus with the rest of the light so yeah. i i wouldn't use a camera that is sensitive to infrared and yeah. so all cameras already have a filter in it that cuts out infrared the question with deep sky photography is that same filter cuts out some of the visible red and we get to our cameras modified to let some of the deep red but still visible light through but it still cuts out infrared using one of those astro modified cameras for the totality would be fine uh, that's fine but the prominences which are your main h alpha source in an eclipse are so bright you don't need an h alpha modified yeah. camera whatever any camera will pick them up uh they're very bright and they're pink they're not deep red uh yeah. as well yeah. The, hi, Alan. This is Larry. So the premise for my question is um, I'm going, since it's, you know, new moon during a solar eclipse, I'm going to be uh, 
a location where I'll have the telescope set up a few days in advance and doing, you know, dark sky, nighttime photography using a ZWO camera of a filter wheel. Well, unfortunately, my filter wheel is fully loaded and I, you know, one of the one of the filters is an IR filter. So I was thinking, well, if I focus the IR filter the night before, leave it on that. And then, you know, during totality, you know, I take off the solar filter the next day, you know, is, would I be able to use that? Again, an IR filter that does what? Let's through um, nothing but infrared? Well, just like a regular IR filter that you would use, like if you're doing nighttime observing of the moon and planets, you know, to cut down a little bit on the brightness, you know, to sharpen it a little bit. Well, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not familiar with what that would do for you, uh, for the eclipse. I, you'd have to practice with, the, with the sun now, and, 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 and with it, with that equipment, practice on the sun now, or even on the moon, and, and see what it does as you switch filters. I'm always assuming the use because it's simplest is a DSLR or mirrorless camera. I know people want to shoot the eclipse with their ZWO ASI cameras and and CMOS cameras, and, and they can work. That's that's fine, but that's a lot more complicated to set up and use. And uh, and yeah, there, there, maybe you want to shoot some deep sky stuff while you're at your site or whatever. But you know, you can get some great shots with. <laughs> Just your stock cameras. You don't need the astronomy cameras. But if you want to use that, practice now on the sun and moon and see what happens when you switch filters and does the focus change or not. Um, of course, during the sun now, you can't take the fil solar filter off and let that sunlight blast through onto your camera. So, you know, there's that there's that question. Um, but, um, yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm always assuming the use of more stock cameras for the eclipse. It's all you really need. And it sounds Thank like uh, filters would, filters like that would introduce some internal reflections too during like Bailey's beads and diamond ring effect. They they certainly can. Uh, they any any kind of filter can can introduce those reflections. Um, and and uh, during the little movie clip I showed at the near the start of the talk with the uh, with the two hundred millimeter lens, I was getting internal reflections because the sun was off to one side, and I was getting internal reflections of that really bright crescent just from the optics. There's no filter on the camera itself or the lens, just the optics bouncing around that, that is the most demanding subject of any lens in terms of lens flares is that diamond ring or the, the the last crescent thin crescent sun without a filter on your camera you'll see and that you can test kind of test for that by shooting the crescent moon and just overexposing putting it off to one side as well seeing how many lens flares and things that you get as well but it, it, almost always you get some with the diamond rings it's almost inevitable okay it looks like uh mr shanos has raised his hand greg you want to go ahead and ask your question uh, yeah, i have a question um well it's two questions actually uh, have you ever taken a flash spectrum and have you seen shadow bands how do you recommend photographing uh with a flash spec to, to get a flash spectrum and shadow bands I've I've not ever taken a flash spectrum. And what this is for those not familiar is that you've got a very thin slit of light at the you know second and third contacts that is acting as a natural slit and you have a diffraction grading of some kind and you get this brilliant flash spectrum. The expert on that, because I know Richard did this in 2017 and I assume he's planning, is Richard Barry. Um, um, I used to work for Richard when I was at Astronomy Magazine. And so look up Richard Berry on, he's on Facebook or whatever, and, 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 and ask Richard. He's the expert on taking the flash spectrum. I have no experience with that whatsoever. Uh, it's a very specialized type of image. Uh, kind of unique, though. Shadow bands, now you're asking about shadow bands, is a little different. Uh, again, it's, they appear... Um, uh, two or three minutes before totality and then two or three minutes after totality. And I've never photographed them. They're very challenging, but you could do it with a movie camera aimed down at a white sheet. And I, that's what I had in 2017, white sheet on the ground. And to and, and the little app from Gordon Telepon reminds you to look for shadow bands. And I did. And 
because most eclipses, I'm not thinking to look for shadow bands, but I got a reminder, there they were, fleeting bands of dark and light racing across this white sheet on the ground, and a challenge to photograph, but a movie camera aimed at the white sheet might do it, just normal exposure, yeah, and I'm probably to break up I, the I, contrast I, in processing later on. It's possible. I've never done it. You can search on the yeah, web. I'm and to try that. I'm going to have a second camcorder focused on a white sheet and just let it go, and I'll look at it after. Yeah, exactly. It. All right, yeah. thank you. Okay, I, you're welcome. I used a setup that I found. Uh, these folks used it during an eclipse in Indonesia, and I did it in 2017. They set up a whiteboard on, like, this uh, tripod, you know, display stand and had a camcorder pointed at it to get shadow bands. And they also had one of those, you know, curved mirrors on the side with temperature gauges. And I I couldn't find the gauges in time to read clearly, but that works really well, too, if you just want to set up, like, a little a little, you know, whiteboard for markers and stuff like that on a little stand and point a camera at it and that works really good yeah, okay there's many 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 ways of photographing the eclipse uh, you know. yep. <laughs> so i did see a, another one here in the chat that says what about welding shield glass you know use think number 14 which is correct so Yes, for visual, I wouldn't use them yeah. to photograph through, no. except, you know, I don't know, the phone camera or whatever. But typically, for for photographing the, the partial phases of an eclipse, um, you know, with a, with a wide-angle lens or phone camera, I just, I'll just hold up, you know, one of these kind of filters and just grab a shot um, and just put hold this in front of the lens of a phone or wide angle camera and uh and then you you filter just the sun and but the rest of the scene is still recorded uh in normal light and that's one way to get a grab shot of the partial phase with the sun filtered in the sky as a little crescent sun in the sky um so that's that's one way to do it um but uh, uh anyway uh there's there's all kinds of ways of just getting stuff fairly simply done uh, without a lot of effort. And I did see another question in the chat that says, can you use a H-alpha filter instead of white light, or is it better to stay with white light? During the partial phases, you can certainly shoot the partial eclipse through an H-alpha filter, providing you got experience shooting the sun with an H-alpha filter. Uh, you were talking about an H-alpha solar filter. Then, then if you've got experience, you're doing that now with the sun, to get prominences and things like that, you can certainly shoot the partial phases through an H alpha scope. It will be totally useless during totality. You won't see a thing. Yep. So the, the moon is acting as your filter and showing you the prominences that you can see looking at naked eye. You don't need an H alpha scope. But during the partial phases, yeah, an H alpha scope would be. I've never, I've never shot the sun with an h alpha scope i have no experience with that but if you got that experience yeah you could take it with you to shoot the partial phases but not totality and one thing i'll mention is i've never seen a composite like eclipse shot where the partial phases were taken in h alpha while like the totality was taken with a you know straight dslr camera or something like that i've never seen a composite like that so Somebody do that and uh, show it to me. That'd be cool. There you go. There's your challenge for next year. <laughs> Anybody else want to ask any questions? Just blurt it out or raise your hand. Either way. Could I ask you to elaborate a little bit on the uh, the black polymer filters? I, I recently bought a new filter, and I, I don't want to have you call out brand names or anything if you're not comfortable with that, but um, what are the characteristics of black polymer that I want to make sure I've I don't have one. Uh, well, black polymer filters are, are black plastic. They generally don't look shiny and reflective like this. They, they look black. In fact, that's what most... No, that's, that's not. That's what most... I, I'm going to say eyeglass filters are kind of made out of the black polymer because they're, they're perfectly fine for visual use. Um, but they, they just look like very black plastic, but they're, but they're very, 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 very dense. Are they rigid? This because kind of, this kind of looks, 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 it's got a bit of a shiny look to it, but 
So I'm not sure if this is or not, but but a lot of the eclipse glasses are black polymer, and they're they're perfectly fine for visual use or just wide angle iPhone photography or something like that. But mm -hmm. I, I've tested several of them, and someone in the chat was asking about am I getting more specific about filters in my ebook? Yes, I show you several pages of tests of this brand versus this brand versus this brand, ah, this okay. type of filter versus this type of filter. And the black polymer type um, I, I found was it had more scatter around the sun. It just scattered. The contrast wasn't as good. And also the focus was a little soft on the black polymer versus the mylar uh, filters, which I think are your best bet for telescopes and long telephoto lenses. Um uh, one glass filter, and I showed it in the ebook that I bought for the telescope. It was useless. It was just so soft and fuzzy. It was like just window glass. It was just wasn't plain parallel glass. But some that I have for the smaller, uh, smaller telephoto lenses, uh, like this one. This is the one I. Uh, no, I didn't use it. I used a smaller sixty-seven for the telephoto shot of the of the uh, annular eclipse. Same same company, same brand, just a smaller size. Um, but I tested this a this eighty-two on my uh, on this lens here for the uh, annular eclipse, and it was fine. Uh, I didn't use it. I used the case filter, but I did do a test with the Seymour, and it was it was fine. And this is glass, so okay. I, I yeah. don't know. Some some of them are the glass filters are fine, but. Glass filters are getting harder to find, and and in the large sizes may not be that great a quality uh, these days. The pe manufacturers just can't get the plain parallel glass. I'm not sure. So that's why the mylar filters are your by far the best bet. They do have a little more light scatter on them, but it's 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 not bad. But they're very sharp, and, and just yeah. keep them nice and wrinkly like that. They they work fine. Okay, thank Can you. you. Alrighty. Can you use a two x x Extender for a 400 millimeter telephoto lens? Yes, yes, you certainly can. Uh, you can use a tele extender if you want to get a little more reach magnification. I did that for the uh, telephoto uh, movie of the sun moving across. So I had the 200 millimeter and a 1.4x tele extender. It was the longest kind of focal length of the lens I had at the time uh, in 2017. And it worked fine, but it did produce more of that flaring and, and lens flares from the crescent sun. I think largely because of the optics in the tele extender, probably. Uh, and so, yeah, you can certainly use a tele extender. Okay. Just keep in mind that you're you're losing a stop or two stops yes. of light. Thank you. All right. Another one from the chat. Uh, which program would you recommend to isolate photos from a 4K movie? Oh gosh, I, I'm afraid I don't I don't can't recommend a program to do that. You uh, how, I, uh, you certainly could shoot an 8K movie and then just any movie editing software is going to allow you to extract a frame out of the movie. You can always export an individual frame, just put your cursor on the frame. And in fact, you could probably export a whole series of frames you know, a 30th of a second apart or whatever, and then stack those for some noise reduction. Um, and so you could take like an 8K movie and and export still frames out of it and get still images that way. It's not the best way to shoot still images, but if you want to shoot a movie and then you want to just focus on shooting a movie and get some still frames as a bonus, it's a one way to do it. But the movie quality will never be as good as a raw still frame where you can now process the raw file and get the full dynamic range uh, from a raw file. Movies are always compressed to some extent. There, there's a, Some cameras can shoot raw movie files, but God, they get into like dozens of gigabytes in size and really hard to process yeah. as well. Only certain software will do it. Um, and so that's really, that's why shooting in the um, uh, uh, C-Log or log mode gives you a little more dynamic range than just regular movie settings to play with in processing but you now do have to do some stretching of the of the movie and apply a, a log curve in processing uh the movie to but my book shows some examples of shooting the moon this is where i practiced on the moon last year with the movie camera you know the the well the r5 i think it was the r5 shooting it in various 
movie modes, log, 4K, 8K, you know, whatever, on the crescent moon with wide dynamic range to see what is it recording the most detail of, which mode records the most detail on that wide dynamic range of the moon. So if you want to shoot movies, again, the moon is a great test object to test all your different modes of operation and see which one, which combination works the best. Right. Looks like John Miller is raising his hand. John, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, uh, this sounds like it's going to take a lot of storage. How big a card could you have ready in your camera? As as big as you can can muster. I mean, you take as many pictures as you, you know, you don't have to take thousands of pictures, but you certainly can. Cards are cheap. Well, you've, 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 made, you've, you've made a recommendation of, you know, doing the multiple exposures for, yeah, for, sure. yeah. for a variety of times. Yeah, so, you can, so you it, can come it, away you with gonna... several, a couple of thousand pictures uh, in your card, but uh, 256 or 512, uh, whatever it is, uh, card is not expensive. You want to get a reasonably fast card, especially if you're writing pic pictures pretty quickly, especially if you intend to shoot in rapid burst mode at the diamond rings, that's when you wanna shoot a pretty fast, uh, have a pretty fast card. So it writes to the card quickly, but that's what you wanna practice on beforehand because you could find your camera locking up uh, at second contact. You take in a whole bunch of burst modes and then it's waiting and waiting and waiting and it's writing and writing and the eclipse is happening and now your camera is unresponsive for, the next 10, 20, 30 seconds or something until you can start shooting. So you really want to practice that. That's where a fast card can really help. Uh, or you might really need a fast card if you want to shoot an 8K movie or something like that, or a high quality 4K movie. So um, that's, you got to practice on that. But, um, and then you can get, well, if you don't have, but some cameras have two cards, you can set it up to write the images to both cards and so you're you got a backup in case a, a card fails. A friend of mine, you know, lost some shots of whatever no, solar lunar eclipse, last lunar eclipse, because put the card in and card not readable. You know, something got corrupt. So you can set up your camera to sh record the same images to both cards as a backup as well. But practice with what's what's going to be what's going to work, and uh, and have a have a always have a spare card with you anyway. And the fastest cards have like a 10 labeled on them, right? Isn't, isn't that how that works? There's like a number 10 on there or something? Uh, I'm, I'm, I've, I'm forgetting what the encode. It's, it's really complicated. Yeah. Just go to your camera store or, or check your camera store and sort out. They'll have something information there for you in terms of, you know, obviously the more expensive the cards, the faster it is typically. And, and, uh, and so how fast do you need it? If you don't, you only need the really fastest cards. You're shooting 8K movies, in which case you you, you probably can't use an SD card. You're using a compact uh, CF Express card. In in that particular case, your camera then takes that requires that kind of card. And uh, so, um, but again, you you just practice and you see what works. And if it's not working properly, you know you got to get the faster card. Thanks. Mo better, mo bigger, mo better. Thanks. Yep. All right. Looks like th th there's a couple similar questions in here, but I'll I'll ask one. So, when using a 300 millimeter lens on a mirrorless camera, is it okay to begin photographing without solar filter one to two minutes before totality begins? You know, just confirming it will not hurt the sensor. Yes. Yes. And and that's what, exactly what I suggested doing is that you can um, <laughs> take the filter. Uh, whoops take the filter off the telescope or, or lens uh, a couple of minutes before totality and, and, uh, and then start shooting. Cause if you want to get the diamond rings, that's when you have to start shooting. You know, the diamond rings are a few seconds before totality or the 30 seconds or something before totality, before second contact. And then after third contact, so you have to shoot without a filter to get the diamond rings. If you put your leave your filter on until the app says remove filters now, you've missed the diamond rings, perhaps. So it's perfectly safe, but you wouldn't want to have it for any length of time um, aimed at the sun without a filter on it. 
All right. Looks like we got all the questions in the chat. Uh, we can take maybe one or two more, then we'll call it a night. So anybody have any last minute questions for Mr. Dyer? This is your chance. Great. Excellent silence there. So that means we're done. Uh, so this will remind everyone to join us uh, next month. I already put the link in the chat, but if you missed it, I can throw it in there again. Uh, but remember, uh, Alan will return on December 15th for part two, how to process your eclipse images. And uh, so be sure you register with the link in the chat, or of course you can find the link on our website, Online. Dot org. So thank you very much, Alan, and uh, we'll see you next month. All right. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, everyone. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll see you next month. I haven't put the talk together yet for next month, and it will be a pre-recorded talk rather than trying to do the processing live. So that'll be a movie that Richard will be playing in, but I'll still be present live before and after. But I've, I've got to pre-record that because I got to switch so many different images and software. It's easier just to do that in record it and edit that and put the a little movie of the talk together all right thank you alan